Hey everyone, I'm your host Salwani Reddy and a very warm welcome to day 2 of the Green Switch. It is great to see so many of you tuned in. Thank you all for joining in and we truly hope you enjoy day 2 of the Green Switch as much as day 1, if not more. So before we kickstart this session, for those of you who, who were with us yesterday, there was a small technical glitch due to which the session had stopped abruptly. We truly apologize for that. The continuation of the session and the completion of Dr. Salesh Rao's presentation took place through a private meeting, the recording of which will be uploaded on YouTube and the link will be shared with you all. You may watch the session and fill the feedback form accordingly in order to be eligible for the certificate for day one. All the updates regarding this will be shared on the WhatsApp group. And as for today's session, please stay tuned till the ending uh, and the feedback form will be shared in order to get the certificate. So, um, all right, uh, let's start, let's go ahead. Um, we truly hope you enjoy as well as learn from the session and let's begin. So for our new audience, let me just brush you up a little bit on who's conducting the event, what the Green Switch even is and what our motivation was behind it. So the Green Switch is the product of a collaboration between Tears of the Earth and Swadhyaya Youth Organization. Tears of the Earth, being true to its name, is an organization that works towards the common goal, that is, the prosperity of planet Earth. Their initiative aims to tap and refine the immense potential of the children and younger generations to make them robust and unlock their potential for the greater good. They also involve in and encourage cleanup drives, rallies for climate protection, while bringing research and development among the reach of aspiring saviors of the planet. The Crying Species is an initiative under Tears of Earth for animals. They work towards providing awareness, health, shelter and food for animals. Swadhyaya is a youth-led and change-oriented collective which aims to promote environmental conservation, human and animal rights, inclusive education and justice for all. At Swadhyaya, we work towards creating a resilient global network of young people working at grassroots levels so that our fight against issues like climate change do not remain isolated and become part of a larger global movement. Tears of the Earth and Swadhyaya have teamed up to bring to you the Green Switch. The Green Switch is a joint initiative by the crying species, Tears of Earth, and Swadhyaya Youth Organization, uh, which looks at vegan a diet through the lens of science. It is the first step towards a cleaner diet. The Green Switch aims to empower individuals with the right tools to switch over to a greener and sustainable food choice. So before we dive into today's topic, we have a very interesting video to show you. So on to the video. stating that cows produce more greenhouse gases than the entire transportation sector. This means that raising cattle produces more greenhouse gases than all cars, trucks, trains, boats, planes combined. 13% compared to 18% for livestock. This is because cows produce a substantial amount of methane from their digestive process. Methane gas from livestock is 25 to 100 times more destructive than carbon dioxide from vehicles. Here I'd been riding my bike everywhere to help reduce emissions, but it turns out there's more to climate change than just fossil fuels. I started doing more research. The UN, along with other agencies, reported that not only did livestock play a major role in global warming, it is also the leading cause of resource consumption and environmental degradation destroying the planet today. Due to water How is it possible I wish? Hydraulic fracturing for natural gas uses an incredible amount of water. A staggering 100 billion gallons of water is used every year in the United States. But when I compare this with animal agriculture, raising livestock just in the US consumes 34 trillion gallons of water. And it turns out the methane emissions from both industries are nearly equal. I found out that one quarter pound hamburger requires over 660 gallons of water to produce. Here I've been taking these short showers trying to save water and to find out just eating one hamburger is the equivalent of showering two entire months. So much attention is given to lowering our home water use, yet domestic water use is only 5% of what is consumed in the U.S. versus 55% for animal agriculture. That's because it takes upwards of 2,500 gallons of water to produce one pound of beef. Worse than I, I went on the government's... In 2009, two advisors from the World Bank released an analysis on human-induced greenhouse gases finding that animal agriculture was responsible not for 18%, as the U.N. stated, but was actually 51% of all greenhouse gases, 51%. Yet all we hear about is burning fossil fuels. 
This devastating figure is due to clear-cutting rainforest for grazing, respiration, and all the waste animals produced. This makes animal agriculture the number one contributor to human-caused climate change. But not only that, I found out raising animals for food consumes a third of all the planet's fresh water, occupies up to 45% of the Earth's land, is responsible for up to 91% of Amazon destruction, is a leading cause of species extinction, ocean dead zones, and habitat destruction. A statistic that 116,000 pounds of farm animal excrement is produced every second in the United States alone. That is enough waste per year to cover every square foot of San Francisco, New York City, Tokyo, Paris, New Delhi, Berlin, Hong Kong, London, Rio de Janeiro, Delaware, Bali, Costa Rica, and Denmark combined. Our global rainforests are essentially the planet's lungs. They breathe in CO2 and exhale oxygen. An acre of rainforest is cleared every second. And the leading cause is to graze animals and grow their feed crops. That is essentially an entire football field cleared every single second. And it is estimated that every day, to 100 plant, animal, and insect species are lost due to rainforest destruction. Rainforest. It is estimated that palm oil is responsible for 26 million acres being cleared. Though, compared to livestock and their feed crops, they were responsible for 136 million acres of rainforest lost in use and population. But, if we were to use the market guard model of raising animals, which requires 4,500 acres producing 80,000 pounds of meat, the average American eats 209 pounds of meat per year. If that was all grass-fed beef, only 382 people could be fed on their land. That equates to 11.7 acres per person times 314 million Americans, which equals 3.7 billion acres of grazing land. Unfortunately, there are only 1.9 billion acres in the U.S.'s lower 48 states. Currently, nearly half of all United States land is already dedicated to animal agriculture. If we were to switch over to grass-fed beef, it would require clearing every square inch of the United States, up into Canada, all of Central America, and well into South America. And this is just to feed the United States' demand on meat. But that figure doesn't even take into consideration that much of that land isn't suited to graze livestock. We would have to convert all mountain ranges to grassland, clear ancient forests and national parks grazing, and demolish every city just to make room to graze cows. Just like Brazil, the United States isn't suited to meet the demands for meat. It takes... In 1812, there are 1 billion people on the planet. In 1912, there are 1.5 billion. Then, just 100 years later, our population exploded to 7 billion humans. This number is rightly given a great deal of attention, but an even more important figure when determining world population is the world's 70 billion farm animals humans raise. The human population drinks 5.2 billion gallons of water every day and eats 21 billion pounds of food. But just the world's 1.5 billion cows alone drink 45 billion gallons of water every day and eat 135 billion pounds of food. This isn't so much a human population issue, it's a human eating animals population issue. Environmental organizations not addressing this is like health organizations trying to stop lung cancer without addressing cigarette smoking. But instead of secondhand smoking, it's secondhand eating, which affects the entire planet. To feed a We're person growing. on an all-plant-based vegan diet for a year requires just one-sixth of an acre of land. To feed that same person on a vegetarian diet that includes eggs and dairy requires three times as much land. To feed an average U.S. citizen's high-consumption diet of meat, dairy, and eggs requires 18 times as much land. This is because you can produce 37,000 pounds of vegetables on one and a half acres, but only 375 pounds of meat on that same plot of land. I also learned the comparison doesn't end with land use. A vegan diet produces half as much CO2 as an American omnivore, uses one eleventh the amount of one thirteenth land. After adding this all up, I realized I had the choice every single day to save over 1,100 gallons of water, 45 pounds of grain, 30 square feet of forested land, the equivalent of 20 pounds of CO2, and one animal's life every single day. More.
If we all I had to come to the full conclusion, the only way to sustainably and ethically live on this planet with 7 billion other people is to live an entirely plant-based vegan diet. I decided instead of eating others, to eat for others. At first, like these environmental groups, I was afraid of what it'd mean to change. But now, I embrace it. All this talk about sustainability sounded like our planet was on some sort of life support. And I don't want her to simply survive. Sorry about that, I was on mute. So um, that was a wonderful video and it really amazingly just threw light on the topic of the day, which is uh, dairy and poultry as potential contributors to the climate crisis. So when it comes to being more sustainable and adopting a sustainable diet, and in general, dairy and poultry are not often given much importance um, when you consider their, their impact on the environment. People usually give up red meat, but rarely give up on dairy, uh, dairy and poultry. So to enlighten you a little more uh, on this and share his vast knowledge, we have with us Mr. Uh, Rituraj uh, Rupam. Mr. Rituraj is uh, an environmental activist and writer based in Assam. A commerce graduate, he quit his government job to begin a lifelong engagement with nature, traveling, writing, and teaching students about the environment, wildlife, and climate change. He is the Secretary General of uh, Green Guard Nature Organization a grassroots civil society, uh, uh, civil society group working with uh, fringe forest communities to explore and establish sustainable options for the management of man-animal conflict. He also serves as the chief operating officer of Walk for Water, a group that is leading a global water conservation movement with a mission to provide universal access to safe water. Rituraj is a climate reality leader trained in Istanbul in 2013 and is a national coordinator for biodiversity in climate reality India. Rituraj was a member of the International Antarctic Expedition led by polar explorer Robert Swan, who is the first man to have walked both the poles in 2013. Completing a personal leadership and environmental sustainability program called Leadership on the Edge. He has also traveled to the Canadian Arctic on an Earthwatch expedition called climate change at the Arctic's edge to participate in an ongoing citizen science research about the impacts of global warming on the fragile Arctic ecosystems while based at the uh, Church uh, Northern Study Center. As the Assam coordinator for Kids for Tigers, he works with schools to sensitize students about the connection between tigers, their forest habitat, climate change, and conservation needs and consequences. Jitaraj is the Associate Direct Editor of Igniting Minds, a national magazine for the youth inspired by the late visionary and Indian president, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. He is a frequent contributor to the other publications as well as regular opiates on um, environmental issues in leading newspapers. His blog, CARE, which stands for Climate Awareness Report for Earth, focuses on climate change impacts and on people's, um, on people's lives, mitigations and adaptations. So my oh my, like what a brilliant and inspiring profile. And without any further ado, let's invite Mr. Rituraj Kupin to share his valuable knowledge. Uh, before we start, if you have uh, any questions to ask him during his presentation, please do type it in the chat box as we'll be having a question and answer session later on. Uh, so Mr. Uh, Rituraj Kupin, you may please begin. We cannot wait to hear from you. Thank you, Sir Vani. And uh, while I share my screen. Yeah. Uh, I think you will have to stop sharing your screen. Yes, sir. So I that. Okay. Right. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Green Switch and uh, all the organizers for inviting me for this absolutely important and brilliant conversation. I feel very little it's been uh, talked 
talked about in terms of uh, the impact of livestock farming uh, and all the related issues uh, on climate uh, change. Although this year, finally, uh, I believe the conversation is starting to change. Uh, so the topic uh, today is uh, livestock farming and the climate crisis. Uh, but let me start with the weather report, the climate change part of it. I've been doing this in my presentations uh, in the past few months because this has been an extraordinary summer with the hottest month ever recorded in July 2021 and extreme anomalies between temperatures in the same place. Just three days uh, in August 14th and 17th. Look at the difference. It's about 25 to 30 degrees in some countries like Slovenia, Australia, Hungary. So it's such extreme range of temperatures. For us as human beings, we might stay indoors, we may switch on the air conditioner or the room heater, but for wildlife, it is a big, big issue for uh, all kinds of animals, domestic animals as well. Uh, in fact, uh, one thing that was hardly talked about was the death of billions of uh, marine animals that were cooked uh, during the heat dome that hit North America uh, in the month of June. Uh, some of my friends have been saying that, okay, the months of June and July are always warm. What is the difference? But if you just look at how the earth used to be less than 100 years back and what it looks like now, you can see the change. The planet has warmed. Uh, 19 of the hottest years have happened in the past 20 years. And the last seven years has been the worst and this year is likely to turn this bad as well. So uh, we all heard about the IPCC report published on the 9th of August. Uh, for me, the most important part of it, uh, of course, uh, there were many important components, uh, like uh, for the first time, the IPCC blamed human beings for climate change. Uh, for the first time, IPCC talked about how warming is already locked in and how some impacts like sea level rise uh, as well as uh, uh, impacts on biodiversity are likely to continue for hundreds and maybe even thousands of years. But for me, the most important part was uh, the focus on methane. Uh, methane is a more potent gas than carbon dioxide. We have all, we just saw the video and I think we uh, touched on that as well. And uh, uh, methane em emissions are responsible for around 30% of warming since the pre-industrial era and has IPCC has called for transformative changes in food production, consumption, including adoption of plant-based diets. So the conversation is changing. As I said, people are starting to talk about it. The United Nations, the IPCC, everybody is starting to talk about plant-based diets. Uh, there is no doubt that consumption of meat and dairy is a major driver of climate change. Uh, the figures are really, really very uh, controversial. There is no real consensus on what kind of impact. Uh, we saw in the video, there was a claim of 53%, but there are other studies which claim uh, different uh, percentages, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, one common way of saying it is that uh, emissions from the livestock sector are uh, perhaps more than direct emissions from the transport sector. Now, when you talk about livestock, of course, there are a lot of different issues involved and we, we are going to look a, a bit in depth into all those uh, related issues. Uh, now, even with uh, uh, supply side action to stop you know, production, but because the demand is growing, uh, that means that emissions will continue to rise. So where does this greenhouse gases from food, uh, food production come from? Number one, land use change, clearing forests for farms and ranches, which reduces carbon storage in trees and soils, uh, that is 29% of total food production greenhouse gas emissions. And 38% comes from farmland management activities, such as uh, you know uh, preparing the field. Uh, we heard about uh, palm oil uh, being mentioned in the video, then there are a lot of related issues as well. Uh, then also a lot of fossil fuel is burned to run the tractors and harvesters and all the other machinery. Uh, raising livestock generates 21% of greenhouse gas emissions, and that includes methane that's batched by animals, as well as uh, uh, nitrous oxide and methane that's released from the manure. 
Uh, that again, we will look, uh, there's another slide that looks in depth into that. And then remaining 11% comes from activities uh, beyond the farm gates, which include mining and manufacturing, uh, transportation, etc. Uh, not all foods are the same. Beef is, of course, the largest contributor to climate change, and then other meats uh, as well. And then dairy contributes about 8%, just that uh, over uh, four. Now, uh, the, if you do a comparison between animal-based foods and plant-based foods, uh, emissions from uh, animal-based foods are twice of plant-based. Food production is, of course, a big contributor to climate change, so it is a critical important. It is important to be able to measure greenhouse gas emissions. And currently, the UN Food uh, Summit is on, and uh, that is actually looking at a lot of these issues related to climate change, sustainable food, uh, and the future of uh, how animal agriculture and the entire food production system is going to work. Uh, about 30% of total global man-made greenhouse gas emissions. Now we have another figure with 35%. So all this, uh, uh, there's hardly any consensus on what contributes what, but uh, definitely the major majority of the uh, emissions comes from production of uh, animal-based foods. Uh, this is just a graph showing uh, who are the, which species are the major contributors. These are species that are domesticated by human beings. Uh, as you can see, cattle are the main contributors with about five uh, gigatons of CO2 equivalent emissions about 62% of the entire sector. Uh, then dairy cattle and beef of course generate you know, similar amounts. Uh, then the other ruminants, the small ruminants have lower emissions, uh, but still between seven and 11% of the entire sector. Uh, this is a map of course showing uh, which areas and um, as suspect the areas which should produce and consume a lot of beef is actually the highest. So Latin America and the Caribbean have the highest level of emissions. Um, and although it is uh, reducing in some places, but uh, in other countries, in other places, it is increasing. And uh, India also is there because South Asia is uh, emitting 1.5 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. Now, Look at the emissions by source. Now, this is very interesting. When you talk about emissions from um, from animal agriculture, how does it happen actually? So there are uh, four major uh, processes. One is enteric fermentation, which accounts for about forty four percent of the methane that is generated during the digestive process of the uh, animals. So that also depends on what kind of uh, uh, food you are feeding them, the quality of the rations, how digestible it is also is important. Uh, second is food uh, feed production, and that contributes about 41%, and the emissions uh, from feed crops is really huge. Uh, a lot of uh, destruction of the Amazon rainforest is attributed to produ production of this feed as well. Then manure uh, acts as a source for both methane and nitrous oxide, and that accounts for 10%. Energy consumption, which is something that uh, we really do not account for uh, directly. And uh, most of the lack of consensus between various figures regarding the contribution of animal agriculture to uh, the emissions is because of uh, inclusion or exclusion of one or all of these processes. So there are uh, various issues involved, like ventilation of the processing center, elimination, milking, cooling, uh, transportation, packing, processing, all this uses energy. Uh, and it all adds up to about 5%, but again, a uh, figure that has a lot of uh, no consensus actually, because uh, different industries or different studies attribute different figures for all of these. Uh, like uh, in the video, uh, animal, uh, Agriculture also has a lot of impact on biodiversity. In fact, it is the, the food system production is the, one of the worst drivers of the biodiversity loss. Uh, land degradation, 
Uh, I just talked about the Amazon and then uh, a decline of uh, species across the world is attributed uh, a lot uh, to how we produce food. So what can we do to conserve and sustainably use biodiversity for our well-being? Well, uh, of course, for all of us who are plant-based, we would not think of uh, using biodiversity for human well-being. But uh, as a general rule, this was in 2019, they have asked uh, specifically uh, asked for reduction of meat uh, consumption and coming from the Convention on Biological Diversity, this was a really uh, a groundbreaking report. Eating less or no non-vegetarian food is good for health and for the planet. It is also important to eat and purchase seasonal foods and make sure we buy only local foods most of the time, if not always. And that's something I always tell to all my uh, fellow vegans. Uh, we must uh, also be uh, ecologically conscious, plant-based uh, consumers and ensure that we eat what is produced locally. Uh, and then reduction of food waste is also one of the most critical areas that is hardly addressed by anybody. Uh, we must uh, talk about Amazon because their deforestation has emerged uh, as a major cause for climate change and is having a profound impact on the indigenous communities that inhabit, uh, inhabit these areas, as well as driving biodiversity loss. Uh, remember, a lot of the Amazon destruction is happening for the livestock farming industry. So uh, this is directly related to our uh, talk about climate change and biodiversity loss uh, and change of lifestyle. The Lancet Commission was something, again, uh, which was published in 2019, January. And uh, this was perhaps uh, one of the best studies, uh, three years of extensive research and uh, representing scientists from different uh, allied subjects. And they actually um, recommended a drastic shift to a plant-based diet in order to maintain a healthy human population and a healthy planet. And this came before COVID-19, so this was uh, really groundbreaking as well. Uh, I had done a, a few op-eds on plant-based diet, and uh, which is, I think, quite uh, new for the northeast of India, where uh, people do not usually uh, con consume a lot of vegetarian or vegan food. And uh, I think the key takeaway message from this was uh, the veganism impact study, uh, which was done in the UK, revealed that there would be a 70% decrease in food-related emissions of carbon dioxide if everyone were to go vegan. Of course, that is not happening very, uh, anytime soon. But it will also free up uh, a lot of world's land surface that is currently used for livestock farming and make it available for providing uh, food to 800 million people who are going hungry. The 2010 United Nations uh, Environment Program report also uh, advocated a global shift towards a vegan diet to save the world from hunger, poverty, and the world's, uh, worst impacts of climate change. And this was 11 years back. So the conversation has been going on. It has only got more focus now, uh, uh, but we do not really see action uh, on these uh, reports. So the shifting global demand for meat and dairy is central to achieving the climate goals. Uh, it is unlikely that the commitments met, uh, made by countries under the Paris Agreement will keep us below two degrees Celsius. And uh, a shift in dietary habits would be essential to achieve the targets of 1.5 degrees Celsius warming limit above pre-industrial levels that we all aspire to achieve. Uh, reducing demand for animal products should also significantly reduce the mitigation costs in non-agricultural sectors by increasing the available carbon budget. Because we know that finance is such an important uh, issue. Uh, we know the 2015 Paris Agreement every nation to uh, work towards net Sorry, the Paris Agreement uh, aspired to achieve net zero by 2050. And uh, I think one of the most critical areas while we head into COP26 is that uh, 
countries of the world must uh, try to agree on achieving uh, these well before time because the IPCC report has predicted that we would probably uh, cross the threshold of 1.5 degrees in the uh, next 20 years or so. Now I had another slide, but for some reason, uh, this is not going ahead. Let me try to stop the share and maybe I should try it again. Uh, this is actually the last slide, but uh, I thought it was quite important. A lot of us, uh, Okay, the COP26 at Glasgow uh, will have a lot of focus on indigenous issues, on adaptation, as well as uh, the need for a planetary shift to more sustainable food systems. I think plant-based diets uh, will be a big part of the conversation and I'll be uh, there to take it forward along with my peers as well. Now, my last slide, of course, is that uh, many of us, uh, you know, when you talk about the planetary crisis of biodiversity, of climate change, we tend to think that we are going to save the Earth. No, the Earth will always be there. There may be sea level rise, there may be a loss of species, but uh, what we are essentially trying to do is to save our species, to make the world a better place for our future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful presentation. And I especially loved uh, the last slide of how you said, you know, basically essentially means that we are not in control. Uh, we are the ones who are borrowing the place on the planet and all of that. So I really, really love the message conveyed. And the figures, in fact, I'm sure our audience um, learned a lot from that and um, all of that. So we do have a few questions for you. So first is from my side. I would love to ask you, um, how did you, you know, how, because your profile is so amazing, so inspiring. I want to ask you, like, how did you first get into this field? And what age were you when you really realized that, you know, I have to, you know, do this and, you know, I have to, you know, get into this field? Uh, well, um, I, I used to be in government service, but uh, I had the calling in nature, which made me quit my job and, you know, get into conservation first. And uh, while uh, engaging with the conservation of wild birds and uh, animals, I realized that the underlying challenge uh, behind most of what we do for management of uh, wildlife species is actually climate uh, change impacts. Uh, the habitats are ch changing, the weather is changing, water, uh, vegetation, all this is profoundly affecting uh, uh, wildlife around uh, me. And uh, that is the real challenge. And then uh, because I grew up in Assam in the middle of uh, a civil war like situation where we had conflicts between uh, displaced people and as well as a, a lot of uh, other early climate impact like uh, increased floods, um, erosion, and all of this, if I look in depth, it is all related to climate change. I think that is uh, the trigger. Uh, there were, of course, a lot of other uh, issues, uh, but uh, basically, the more I delved into the topic of conservation or any environmental issue, I think it became quite clear that the anthropogenic uh, changes to our environment, including climate change, are responsible for uh, taking us towards a very suicidal path and we must change that. That's like really great. So, so like, I want to ask you like, how old were you when you realized this and how old oh. were you when you, yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I have always been, uh, you know, close to nature at heart, but uh, it, it probably in my 30s when I realized that, uh, well, uh, what is happening is not uh, correct. And, uh, you know, back in the 1990s, there was uh, this famous uh, speech by Severn Kalis Suzuki at the first Earth Summit at Rio de Janeiro. She was just 12 years old when she talked about how uh, human beings cannot really roll back the damage that we are doing to the planet. Uh, I remember that famous speech and uh, uh, 
read, reading about that somewhere and then that really touched me. I think that was one of the triggers. And then, uh, of course, a lot of personal experiences uh, that has happened and it's not one particular incident, but a series of events, you know, that all adds up to that. But if you are specifically looking at when did I go vegan when, or plant-based, I thought I was living a very hypocritic life uh, because I was involved in issues related to water, biodiversity, and climate change, and which are all interrelated, by the way. Uh, and the more I read about the impacts, the amount, uh, the amount of uh, uh, catastrophic uh, effect that it has on uh, animal agriculture has on the climate, on our water sources, and on biodiversity around the world. Uh, I found, you know, I looked at myself in a very hypocritic uh, way. And I thought that I cannot keep talking this and doing this. So uh, about six years back, I decided to uh, shift to a plant-based site. And I think I've never been healthier. Oh, wow. That's really, really great. And uh, so there's one more thing that I wanted to ask. So, you know, we hear a lot of, you know, this spreads through social media. And generally, like, it's a thing that we hear that, you know, crops such as maybe um, almond, like, which is very water intensive and other, like, people always try to throw trash on a few plant, a uh, few crops such as maybe avocado and almond. And they kind of use that as excuses to, you know, say that even plant-based foods uh, are harmful to the planet. So what would you like to say to those people and what would be your response to such um, you know, people who claim uh, all of this? I think that's a a uh, great question and a very important issue. And I think I briefly touch upon that when I say that it's important when, uh, as uh, plant-based people, uh, we have to uh, stick to locally produced uh, food uh, and not uh, patronize stuff that is uh, really transported from another area to be made available to you because you are adding to the problem. And uh, to have a seasonal diet I mean, uh, you know, would you, would you believe it like about 25 years back, uh, vegetables like tomatoes and cabbages, they used to be seasonal. Mm. Now you find them throughout the year. Why? Because of the demand. Uh, okay. I mean, it's fine. Almond is, we do not need to eat only almond or we do not only need to go for avocado to stay healthy. We have, I think, if huge number of a huge variety of uh, vegetables available seasonal uh, vegetables and fruits that can really make us uh, healthy and they are suited for our uh, own places whatever region we live in so it is important to stick to what is locally produced uh, and seasonal that is very important we should not aspire for something that has been endorsed just by the Western diet. And that is the root of the problem, actually. Uh, protein, protein, protein. That protein fixation is such a wrong thing. And that is driving a lot of, uh, uh, you know, animal agriculture as well. Right. So would you say that um, if someone were to still continue, maybe uh, continuing the consumption of almonds and avocados, would you say that that is still um, definitely better than consuming a meat-based diet? and a vegetarian or like a non-vegetarian diet? Absolutely. Definitely. I mean, there's no really comparison between, uh, uh, you know, the amount of uh, carbon emissions or water that is used in production of uh, any plant-based food. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, anything is better than meat or yeah. any non-vegetarian food. Yeah. So uh, we have a question in the chat box. So, uh, can you can you shed some light on what you believe caused a rise in the poultry industry, especially in the Indian landscape? Oh yeah, uh, good question. I think one is that protein fixation, and uh, uh, you know, it's the media. Basically, every where we, you know, I, I remember many years back. First, there was a big campaign in the, you know with everybody talking about how the egg yolk is harmful. And then after some years, the narrative changed and it became healthy. And then everybody wanted to eat only the, you know, at one point of time, the egg, egg whites, because apparently only that gave you the big muscles. Mm -hmm. and, and all these, uh, I think, are just, uh, you know, uh, marketing strategies 
that right. uh, are you know planted in the media and that is what really pushes you then same thing with chicken now there is a lot of focus on uh, on the poultry industry because many people are trying to push this as an environment climate change meat uh, climate change friendly meat right uh, but yeah. if you look at um, the emissions it is not um, uh, you know negligible it is quite significant and besides that uh, if you also look at uh, you know the poultry industry from the point of human health uh, it is not very healthy. We know there are, have been studies which show that the amount of uh, toxins, the amount of uh, antibiotics that is used in the poultry industry is really, really harmful. And it is slowly making your human body immune to all these antibiotics. Exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. So the rise of the poultry industry is not really uh, good. I think it is just uh, fueled by uh, this uh, protein fixation and the media planted stories. Right, yeah, totally agree. And like, especially because I've heard like such horror stories of, you know, chickens being injected with like, you know, um, hormones and whatnot, just to, you know, make the chicken look bigger and to make the meat more, you know, delicious and more juicy or whatever. So it's, it's, it's just horrible. And, you know, it, it takes a toll on one's health over like continued consumption. So I'm uh, really glad you brought that up. And uh, so our next question we have is, uh, what are your opinions about the energy consumption uh, between cow's milk and soya milk? So I guess this is sort of related to a uh, previous question. And uh, is there a balance in energy trade-off? And if not, then how can we ensure it? Uh, this is really uh, something uh, that we have to choose because uh, if we choose to have milk that is any kind of milk, whether it's cow's milk or soy milk, that is packaged and transported and, and uh, distributed uh, from a from one specific location, and you buy that from the market, then there's a likelihood of you uh, contributing to the emissions, right? To announce emissions. Uh, however, a lot of plant-based milk can be produced at home, and uh, it can be locally sourced. So if you really have to make a choice, I guess, uh, of course, you cannot, uh, I'm not, I'm never going to be advocating, uh, you know, other, other animals uh, milk, which is essentially unnatural. But uh, if you really need uh, the soy milk or almond milk, I think uh, it could be produced locally or at home. That would be mm. the best. Yes, sir, I totally agree. I mean, it's so easy and cheap to even make it at home instead of buying packets. And that's where the whole notion of it being so expensive comes about because of all of that. Yes. So we have one uh, final question for you. So um, again, when people mostly talk about like vegan diets, it's revolving around, you know, the climate and warming and all of that. But there are other problems as well, which uh, when it comes to health and especially, you know, um, the most recent incident, which is and the ongoing uh, problem, which is the coronavirus pandemic. So all uh, consumption of animal-based diets can have such implications as well. So if you could, you know, share some of your views on that. Uh, definitely. I think uh, it is quite clear that all of, almost most of the zoonotic diseases have uh, been related to consumption of uh, uh, animal meat as well as uh, other products. And uh, of course, uh, uh, destruction of wildlife habitats, which has got us closer to uh, is wildlife or uh, animals in the wild. Um, there are other factors as well, because in the future, we might see more and more of these viruses emerging from uh, where they are buried in the permafrost because of climate change, uh, uh, the permafrost is melting and a lot of viruses, uh, some of them known like anthrax, for example, which uh, uh, had an outbreak uh, a few years back. And yeah. uh, when, when people looked at where it came from, they actually located the, a dead reindeer which was buried for maybe hundreds of years, uh, somehow got contact with the uh, domesticated reindeer. And then from there, it came to the humans. Uh, and there are a lot of other viruses, you know, that are buried there, which we may not even know, and that can uh, be transmitted to humans. In the future. But there is a 
close relationship between viruses, emerging viruses, uh, climate and human health. So yeah, these are all interconnected issues. Yeah. And it's especially like, since you've mentioned it, like you know, the whole permafrost melting and everything, like it's very scary when you consider, you don't know what can come out. You don't know, you don't know what can, you know, just break out at any time and, you know, wipe out humanity as we know it. So it's just, it's just very scary, you know, to really think about it. So um, we have one last question, uh, which is, okay. So would the sudden drop in uh, poultry, dairy, red meat, animal husbandry, et cetera, have an impact on livelihood of people? And uh, if it does, how uh, do we ensure that people find another source or, you know, um, to supplement, to uh, avoid a huge surge of unemployment, as there are many people involved in through, an empl uh, through employment in this industry? Well, first of all, I think uh, there will not be a sudden overnight drop, right? What will happen will be a gradual transition. And... It is already happening. We have, uh, if we look at the reports coming in from the US, from the UK, uh, there are already a lot of uh, transitions happening. Uh, yeah. Some dairy farmers have switched to production of uh, plant-based milks. Uh, similarly, mm -hmm. uh, the very fact that meat intensive fast food companies like KFC, McDonald's have included plant-based uh, products in their uh, menu. Yeah. It's a pointer to the fact that transition is taking place. So there will never be a sudden overnight drop, I guess. So that issue of livelihoods will take care uh, of itself. And where it doesn't, that is where the uh, issue of climate justice uh, comes in. Uh, people who are impacted by such, for example, in India, millions of uh, you know, farmers' uh, livestock may be affected when the demand runs dry and farmers, because they have been doing it for generations, they do not know what to do next. So I think here uh, there has to be uh, government and civil society helpful to make that uh, transition to other livelihoods. Yeah, especially like so you've mentioned, like it's not really like it's people are not going to turn vegan overnight. So it's not like sudden employment, unemployment overnight. Yeah. And obviously, if the meat and dairy industry uh, demand reduces, something else's demand will increase. So jobs will always open up. And I feel like that's a very funny excuse. And like in general that people give, you know, to sort of brush off uh, veganism and all of that. And to add to that, uh, you know, yeah. um, the two uh, highest growing employment opportunities in the US. Uh, mm. For example, uh, number one is uh, solar uh, technicians, people who fix those and maintain the sol solar panels. And number two is those, uh, uh, the wind uh, technicians. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so they are related to renewable energy. So the transition, I think new jobs will open up as well. Yeah, definitely. Like there's a lot of green jobs and the green market is also increasing slowly. So it's, it's great to see like changes happening slowly, but surely. And uh, yeah, so we've uh, reached, like, answer, ask you all of our questions and you've answered them amazingly. And, you know, I'm sure our audience, like it was really inspiring to have you here. And it was such an informative session that we had. And uh, once again, I really, truly loved your presentation. And I'm sure our audience did it as well. So uh, thank you so much, sir. It was really, really amazing to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm so happy that the Green Switch is organizing such an important event, particularly with the event food, uh, food climate uh, you know, uh, conference happening right now. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And just ahead of COP26 as well. So it's great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. So uh, before we uh, invite our next uh, guest speaker, I have a small task for all of the audience over here. We'll be posting a small poll in the chat box and we would love your opinion on it. Uh, the poll will be active for about uh, two minutes. So please do fill it. Um, and yeah, so we'll be pausing the session for two minutes and uh, while everyone fills the poll. And in the meantime, I would love to know how you're finding the session so far. And um, so please type it in the chat box. I'm really looking forward to your responses. Um, as well as that, we would love to create like a sort of uh, safe space to ask questions as well as raise any awareness. So if there are any non-vegans that have tuned in, 
you may ask your questions to the vegans who have tuned in uh, it can be anything like you know what is your favorite plant milk or you know how did you give up paneer or like anything like that so um, on this topic i'm a vegan too so feel free to ask like any simple or basic questions uh, while everyone's filling the poll so looking forward to your responses so yeah the poll link has been shared in the chat box it will be active for 2 minutes so please do fill the poll uh, we have an interesting activity coming up regarding this uh, towards the ending and in the meantime if everybody if anybody wants to share anything then we would love to hear from you we would love to know how you find the session so far come on guys don't be shy <laughs> we would love to hear from you All right, no worries. I guess our audience is a bit shy today. No worries, you guys will loosen up and uh, become active. I hope. Uh, so the poll is going to keep going on. Uh, it'll be active for a period of two minutes, and um, so please do keep filling it. We have we'll be addressing it uh, towards the ending. So um, yeah. So now I would love to invite our wonderful green activist of the day, Shyamali uh, Gramapadya. Uh, I really hope I'm pron pronouncing your name right. Uh, feel free to correct me if I got it wrong. Uh, so yeah, a little bit about Shyamali. Uh, she runs a page called Planet Ninjas, where they educate people about the real life impacts of climate change, um, while also helping with solutions and alternatives. She's a climate reality leader as well, and in addition, uh, she's a food scientist and she develops plant-based products for different companies. She's also been working with regenerative agriculture, and she has interned at farms and plans to take up you know farming uh, professionally eventually. So, uh, hi, Shamli. Welcome. Hi. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my video. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. you, because I can't see myself, so I wasn't sure. <laughs> so, first of all, Shamli, uh, a big bow to food scientists like you, honestly. Like, for vegans like me who still love the taste of meat, plant-based meats are a big savior. And it's food scientists like you who make it possible. So, thank you so much, <laughs> first of all. And um, how are you doing today? I just good, uh, good. hope you um, good. The, um, I've actually heard... Uh, uh, I speak before um, in one of the climate reality um, events that I attended. So I, listening to him talk again was uh, was really nice. And uh, like you said, I think this is an amazing platform uh, just for open speech. You know, for people to understand um, what other people who switched to plant based diets or vegan yeah, diets yeah. have been through. And um, it, it there's not a lot of people talking about this. So I think this is really really nice that you guys are doing this. Really glad. So. Um... Again, if any of you have any questions for Shamali, then do put them in the chat box. Uh, we'll be addressing it towards the end. And uh, so yeah, so to start off, uh, a little birdie told me that you used to be in love with cheese and even joined the cheese industry initially. And after coming to know the horrors of it, you gave it up completely and adopted a plant-based diet. So why don't you brief us a little bit about your journey and you know how all of this happened? Of course, yeah. Um, so uh, little going. back a little bit before my love for cheese um, so i i grew up in a fairly uh, compassionate and i think uh, um empathetic family uh, we uh, i think we grew up um, not eating a lot of meat um, and then uh, traditionally and culturally uh, but yeah. as as i've traveled more as i've made more friends um, i did start eating meat and quite enjoyed it and this was when i was in school right um and um, i think it was around my um, 11th and um, 12th standards so about 13 years back i don't even know how long ago Uh, but basically then is when um through some sort of an industrial trip or something of that sort we yes. um, actually went to uh, see one of the places the meat slaughter houses um mm. and that's kind of when i understood the realities of what happens when you're actually eating meat right? and and it, it was also a moment of realization of not knowing what eating chicken um actually meant 
um and i've always loved animals i've never had pets or i've never had but i just always i guess growing in a in in growing up in a compassionate family liked animals right so i i would do everything in beyond the range of like a stu- that what a student would do to kind of care yeah. for animals and so it kind of opened my eyes to that and that's kind of when um the age of 17 or 18 decided to turn vegetarian um on my own um and i've been vegetarian ever since then um so um my mom has owned a food business forever and that's how i've always been exposed to newer more western more um, trendy food product before anybody else in the you know in the country already was so i've eaten cheese far far longer than most people my age ever had um and so i grew up loving cheese uh, absolutely loving paneer and they were more like a staple part of part of my staple more than any any other normal uh, indian was probably eating um and so when i chose um while i was choosing my career uh, path i think uh, working the food industry became kind of obvious for me um and so i uh, pursued i decided to plan uh, taking my subjects in the way where i would be able to study food and go on to study uh, dairy and go on to study uh, cheese um and grew up obsessed with wanting to work with cheese just so that i can eat free cheese all the time that was honestly the biggest motivation um and so um i went to the us studied uh, food science um right after that got um my first job ever in uh, a dairy industry one of the biggest dairy companies in the uh, in the us um, oh, wow. and my uh, it was a dream job for me right so um i was working <laughs> with cheese i was working with cheese based seasonings things that go on top of your doritos and your lays and what not and basically got to sample uh, free chips and popcorn every single day while working oh, with cheese right so that was my job and um i worked for about 2 years developing products for a lot of different clients all across the world uh, basically made um, all kinds of fun stuff um and the more i dug deeper into the history of that company the history of where how they've become so big um mm-hmm. where they've been making their profits um uh, is is when i realized what the dairy industry actually stands for um and not just from um you know um an animal uh, cruelty point of view but everything right like the, the the amount of people that have been exploited the amount of land that's been stolen um the amount of environmental damage it's been done and i think uh, it's at that point where it just opened my eyes and um it was a very it was a very uh Uh, it was a very quick transition for me i i didn't have to sit dwelling on it for a long time because once you know the facts you know the facts you can't really um it's it's not really oh let me think about it or you know let me think about what i can do for this um at least that's the way it was for me and so the decision between turning uh, vegan after being vegetarian for a long time just came pretty naturally it it, it wasn't a very um or oh, this is the new trend or you know this is what everybody is doing it just made a lot of sense because i could see the hard facts uh, but obviously i couldn't keep working in the company if i wasn't going to um, make the product so uh, that's kind of when i decided to make the big switch uh, but also realized that uh, it, it wasn't going to work for me if i was going to stay in the us because i needed to make some big changes so uh, that's when we decided to move back and decided to work with companies here so i can use my skills to basically see what i can do for the plant based industry in yeah um this was in 2018 and um between 2018 and even now 2021 there's there's been an explosion of the number of companies that are working in the plant based yeah. industry right um so it was actually pretty hard for me to look for something that will make sense for me in terms of um a, you know a job that i would like but also stay stay where i'm supposed to stay but that worked out and um i started working with a plant based protein beverage company the moment i came back and i've been working in plant based milk ever since um and so yeah that's been my journey uh, a complete switch from you know dairy being a part of every meal every day of my life to um it just completely disappearing overnight pretty much overnight um and just completely changing my career track um and post that i think i've also taken a hard look at why, where the indian industry indian food industry lies within the dairy industry space right because um indian dairy and uh, the it dairies in the western countries are far far different um indian dairy even though very um, unorganized um is still far different than the ones in the west and so took a hard look at that and it brought, took me all the way to the roots of farming took me all the way to uh, seeing 
the way our foods completely changed, the way our food systems completely changed. And so now I'm taking a step back and learning about regenerative agriculture. I've been interning at a couple of different farms and trying to understand where, um, how animal uh, animals have been used in, uh, in farming, but also uh, from more, more from a health perspective of how plant-based diets, whole foods, plant-based diets, local, indigenous, small, seasonal foods, um, and actually what our ancestors have been eating, uh, but, um, uh, you know, and how it's beneficial for health and just completely making this, the modern Indian or the urban Indian is very, very heavily dependent on dairy. And so to and make that switch to seasonal, local, uh, more whole foods is going to be a long way. So trying to study that so I can maybe raise more awareness. Wow, that's really great. And we have someone, uh, one Shikha in the chat box saying that it was a very brave transition. Since, especially since it was not just a uh, diet and job, but it was like country um, as a whole and everything. So that's really amazing. I totally, I totally agree with her. And uh, since you mentioned um, that you joined, uh, like you've helped in developing plant-based foods. So uh, I'm definitely very fascinated by plant-based meats and other alternatives. Yeah. And I would love to like, really love to know like about some of the stuff that you helped develop or some of the companies you've worked with or, you know, how the whole, what, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I haven't worked with plant-based meats as much. My expertise lies mainly in milks. Um, so uh, one of the biggest um, achievements I think for me is the first company that I worked with in India uh, is called Strive. Uh, and we've launched uh, back then, but yeah, we launched uh, India's first protein beverage, uh, plant-based oh. protein beverage. And so it's a ready to drink protein beverage. Um, and uh, so basically the aim was um, there's a lot of rise in this, obsession with protein, like even Dutraj talked about, right? Uh, people are getting obsessed with protein. People are more aware about fitness and uh, they're, they're caring for their health. And so it's not something that people are going to stop consuming or stop doing just because um, you're moving to a vegan diet, right? Um, but there was also a rise in uh, people get feeling allergic to whey because either they were lactose intolerant or the quality of whey was bad. And so it was the right time to capture the market of that source to start converting people to thinking, about plant proteins, which wasn't that common at that point, right? Even just three years ago. And so yeah. uh, basically worked as a very core part of that team, uh, right from product development to pretty much marketing, like everything there. Uh, but yeah, we uh, we got, um, like within the first couple of months, we had we already had about 100 repeat customers and people, you know, constantly giving feedback and telling us how um, it felt lighter on their body as compared to whey and how it felt easier to digest and, um, you know, just their... Um, uh, performance it post their workouts but their performance post their um, uh, programs their athletics had gone up drastically and so that was always good feedback that we received uh, just working with that and so um, that's that's the first company I worked for um, after that I worked with multiple small startups uh, helping them develop milks and basically um, focusing more on making milks from indigenous and local crops. So uh, I'm talking about stuff like um, seeds that come from different fruits across um, other regions or maybe even uh, different kinds of millets. So these are not uh, companies that are trying to make pan India uh, products, at least not yet, uh, but focusing more on hyper-local delivery like the milkman model has has worked before, right? Um, yeah. so those are the kind of companies that I've usually um, uh, worked for in the past, uh, in the last couple of months. Um, also, in addition, I've actually helped a lot of uh, small vegan cafes, uh, kind of, uh, uh, or cafes add uh, vegan items to their menu just so that there's there's uh, more uh, happening there. So just smaller companies, I think uh, those are the ones that actually need help. The bigger ones can. Uh, um, have all of the resources in nature but yeah that's what I've mainly done oh wow that's really really great um just love what you do honestly such an inspiration and uh yeah so um when it goes into like you've mentioned like you know uh uh like producing local uh like milk from local crops yeah and you know, I think, um uh, like alternatives for cafes and all of that you know for the like, inclusivity for vegans as well Correct. so are there like what are the challenges you have faced while doing this and what have like have there been any challenges like especially there must have been like you know when finding the right crops and you know finding out figuring out the technicalities of it 
yeah and in general so so honestly um uh, the food industry in india is brutal it's brutal everywhere uh, mm-hmm. with respect to the fact that um, you have insanely big companies who monopolize everything right um, they to the point where they also monopolize farmlands so you will have a uh, you have uh, uh, people like pepsi owning a lot and lot of land which is monocropping which is just so even from that perspective finding um, for a small company to actually make um, a millet based beverage is going to it's going to cost them maybe 100 rupees for 500 ml mm-hmm. uh, whereas a bigger company can make that in one fourth of the cost so finding that balance uh, uh, between actually standing for what you believe in right so a lot of these companies that are plant based and vegan are also in this for the sustainable point of view right they want to make something more not sustain more sustainable that's better for the planet and not just for the animals so um uh, that's where your packaging comes in play and packaging is also um we unfortunately still don't have any solutions for uh, more sustainable packaging right so you have options like reusable glass and all of that but if you if you look at the big picture uh, people who subscribe to models like this is is a very small number so um standing um for what you believe in practicing that and the uh, and and actually uh, being able to um, do it there's there's a big difference in there right so um uh, going back to the example of the protein beverage um i was also part i was also one of the people responsible for making sure that our sustainability needle is what we called it doesn't sway too far from you know what we've thought of it um yeah. and um i i tried for a good 6 months to find if there are any alternatives to other than the single use plastic bottles that we were using right but there just wasn't so it just meant that the company had to t- make a choice between do i put um, a protein beverage in a plastic single use plastic bottle um and put this product out there as a replacement for whey which does have a huge impact or uh, do i do something in glass uh, where you know there's always more chances of breaking there's always more chances of uh, and you also have higher emissions uh, when you're thinking more glass right because it's heavier to transport and all of that um or yeah. do you just not launch a product like this and instead just launch a powder um which then becomes more universal so it, it, these are the points where uh, you do face a challenge in addition to just the the massive competition that you get from these big companies right who have all of the resources at their disposal to just quickly copy your formula and make that product to one for the cost um yeah. so there's a lot of challenges and um, the fmcg industry just very very brutal so for anybody to survive um, as a small company it's always going to be a matter of having really really loyal consumers uh, who mm-hmm. genuinely see you for who you are and then help you grow and that's the only way to do it uh, because if you want to be a sustainable business in india and also be food um, uh, at least from what i've seen that's the only way to do it right now and you are seeing especially since the pandemic and since people have been on instagram so much you are seeing more and more people um, focusing on hyper local and local um you know people more and more bakeries coming up more and more uh, people coming up so all of this is definitely starting to increase but uh, where it's going to go and how much it's going to increase is all, i think only time will tell but yeah there is a lot i think um, in the last couple of months i've seen at least seven or eight people call me and ask me if they can help me if i can help them make up oat milk which uh, i don't really know if if i'm okay with it but yeah there are more and more people trying to do stuff like this oh wow that's really great and it comes like this further like you know justifies the fact that you know there are so many people complaining that vegan alternatives are expensive and you yeah. know maybe and that's where it all comes into play like if you consider a large company like a huge multi mnc producing something they they obviously so you know make it for much cheaper and afford to sell it for cheaper prices yeah. because they have other side businesses which yeah. you know make more money and cover for the cost and all of that and there are these yeah. companies which are trying their best and yeah. all of that so like it completely justifies everything Correct. like you know all the cost and everything when you really think about yeah, it and, and that's what we Correct. i'm so sorry Yeah. No, no. I'm just agreeing with you. I mean, it's absolutely true. Uh, there's a reason a lot of these products are expensive is because uh, they are ethical and uh, they give back what they're supposed to be giving back, right? Not just to the land, but to the people and to the, to, to whoever is involved in the whole whole ecosystem of it. Um, and so, um, uh, just to give you an example, um, I, I spoke to somebody who was making edible straws, um, and this person started this company because um, he he truly cared for you know, the number of straws, and this was just his gateway into the sustainable yeah. uh, product industry so to say so uh, he's making straws out of something uh, 
really nice. And um, one year into the business, he's like, I've realized 99% of the people don't care about it being sustainable, right? People are just doing this for making it more trendy or um, yeah. things. So he like, you, you, if you care, but the others don't and your consumers don't, you just have to find a way to spin it because it matters that much to you. Uh, so spin it in a way where it will fit that consumer's lifestyle. It will fit what they're looking for today um, as opposed to fighting so many battles where you're just going to keep losing them right um, so he, that's what he's done he just put his product out in all of these trendy cafes and that's what everybody's talking about and that's the way he's he's made his sales right as opposed to uh, printing sustainable on his straws everywhere he's like people don't care if it's vegan people don't care if it's sustainable um, but now I still have people consuming my product or using my product so and which makes a lot of sense yeah, yeah yeah wow like exactly like it all puts things into perspective and makes people understand what really goes into all of this so um yeah and i think i've asked all the questions that i have and thank you so much for answering like in such a nice manner and you know shedding a light a lot of light on this topic which is not really talked about much because yeah. coming from the point of view of someone who is part of the industry it is a different perspective as to other people who are just advocating veganism like you are part of the industry you are working for it you're working to make products so like the perspective was amazing and I don't think like I've gotten this point of view and this perspective before and I feel like I can say that for the audience as well so thank you so much Shamali it was really great having you here and uh, this is my first time talking to a food scientist so it was just amazing for me as well yeah, thank, you. Uh, thank, you, thank you Shamali thank you so much All right, everyone. So we're almost at the end. And if you remember earlier, we made you take part in a poll. So uh, if we could have uh, the results, please. All right. Okay. So I'm so glad that our audience actually voted that this is uh, false. So the question was, uh, a dairy-free diet isn't suitable for growing children. And I'm really glad to see that so many of you voted false, which is actually uh, the answer. So for those of you who did vote true, I would love to, you know, sort of, sort of spread whatever, like, uh, whatever knowledge I have and, you know, um, so that you have the right information. So, uh, yeah. So again, this goes back to uh, our childhood where we've all heard slogans about milk saying that it does the body good and it's the natural thing to drink. And, you know, we've just been growing up with the notion that milk is a natural part uh, cow's milk or animal milk is a part of our natural lifestyle and that's what we have and um, all of us who've heard these slogans while growing up were urged to drink like a glass of milk every day because of its health benefits and you know if you really look into it and if you really look at the factors which people have like there are many scientists that have been working on this and have published reports and uh, it turns out that the case for milk is actually fairly weak so even though milk is a good source of protein calcium and vitamin d like that's not wrong it's definitely a good source but there are also other sources that provide these nutrients. It's not just through milk that you can get these. And um, get this. So there's no evidence that drinking milk actually reduces bone fractures. Like um, there is no proof, there is no substantial proof to prove that drinking milk actually leads to better bones and leads to you know reducing bone fractures and all of that. And there's even a thing that drinking too much milk can lead to uh, anemia and contribute to obesity. So um, yeah. And uh, milk can be found in like um, many sources beside uh, cal sorry, calcium can be found in many sources beside milk, including nuts, beans, and greens. And uh, there's also research that you know raises the notion, like how I said uh, about how milk uh, you know keeps bones strong. There was a 2013 study that found that uh, children who live in countries with lower rates of milk consumption have lower fracture rates than those who live in countries that consume milk. So in general, like the whole notion that, you know, kids need very high levels of calcium to keep their bones strong is actually a very wrong and a very oversold uh, notion. And um, uh, there are also like studies that like, you know, so what does lead to, uh, so like, you know, this again cause thing makes us think like what does lead to our bones being better and you know, reducing bone fracture. So there are studies that uh, have uh, results that, you know, the impacts made on bones when kids do exercise or any other physical activity is the main factor in bone growth. So the best way for kids to take care of, you know, to get good bones and to make stronger bones is to actually go outside and play and uh, not consume milk. 
So uh, now let's come to the other factor of vitamin D. So although vitamin D is a very essential nutrient, it does not naturally occur in milk. So there are other fortified foods such as breakfast cereal, orange juice, and soy milk, which are equally good sources, if not better sources. And uh, when we even come to protein, the amount of protein in milk can also be found in lots of um, other sources such as uh, beans and eggs. So again, the whole notion that milk is required for children's growth and milk is required to you know for a healthy uh, life and for a healthy you know just nutrient filled lifestyle is wrong. And based on all that I've told you right now, and you can always Google all of this these facts and you know help someone else who is you know has the wrong notion about all of this. So that's it for our poll, uh, and uh, that's it for our session as well. Thank you so 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 much to everybody who has joined. We truly hope that this session has been useful, has been informative, and it has helped you develop a new perspective uh, from both of our amazing guest speakers. And uh, tomorrow, watch out. We have two uh, two sessions. So the next session is the role of fisheries in degrading ocean health. So keep a lookout for that. It's going to be a great session. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we'll be sharing the feedback form. Um, not sure if it's going to be shared here or in the group, WhatsApp group. So keep a lookout for that. And uh, so keep a lookout for that and do fill the feedback form in order to be eligible to get the certificate. Thank you all so much for joining. Have a good day. Um, have a good day. Have a good night. And see you tomorrow for tomorrow's sessions. Thank you.